know that the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word is eternal. Good morning, it's Apostle Rodney Chupoyera here. Um, welcome to Kingdom Prosperity Ministries. It's um, Sunday morning, the Sunday that Jesus was raised from the dead. We are grateful to God for such an opportunity to speak to you and to impact life into the lives of people who are watching. I want to just start by praying, releasing a word of prayer. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. I know that the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word is eternal. Send your word this morning. Speak through me. Give me the anointing that makes teaching easy. I pray, oh, my Father, my God, for understanding. Let the people have great understanding concerning what happened on the cross of Calvary, that they may begin to benefit from the benefits of Calvary in the name of Jesus. Anoint the ears of the hearers. Let them not hear a man, but let them hear the voice of God in the name of Jesus. I thank you, my Father, my God, that it is done in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. Um, thank you so much for joining us um, from all over the world. Um, it's Easter, a great time to celebrate the things that God has done for us, to celebrate what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. And I'm so excited this morning to share the word with you. And I pray that people would benefit from the things that I will share and that eyes would be opened concerning exactly what happened on the cross of Calvary. God bless you. Now, I want to start this morning by sharing um, the, the scripture, 1 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 18 and 19. The Bible says there, um, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition of your fathers, but redeemed with precious blood of Jesus as a lamb without spot and without blemish. We have re been redeemed by the power that is in the blood of Jesus. Now, as I was talking to a, a great friend of mine this morning and sharing um, some of the word and saying, you know, in the body of Christ, what we are taught mostly in church, you know, is the New Testament and that's, and that's awesome, that's powerful. The book of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, um, these books, they talk about how Jesus came, you know, you begin maybe in, in, in John um, or Luke 1, Hail Mary, you've been highly favored of the Lord, and how Jesus came down and, um, you know, he was born uh, through the womb of Mary and all of that, and then um, Jesus um, is baptized by John, and after that we see him begin to do uh, great miracles, um, power is released, the disciples are taught a lot of things by Jesus, and then he is betrayed by Judas, he goes to the cross, he dies, and he is resurrected, and all that is awesome and is powerful, but the question must be asked, why did Jesus come? Why is it that Jesus came? Why did God have to send Jesus down to earth and to talk to men, and, 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 and to redeem men as it were? And the issue is that Jesus came because of the fall of Adam. The Bible says in the book of, if you study the book of Genesis, it's the scripture that tells you about the fall of man, how um, Adam and Eve, they fell, they partook of the fruit in the garden they were not supposed to partake of, and that's how they fell, and sin entered into the world, and problems um, happened, and, um, you know, and from Genesis chapter number four, right up to the book of Revelations, we find that this is man's effort uh, um, to try and get back to God, to try and get back to the uh, Eden lifestyle, the life of dominion. And so you find that in the book of uh, Genesis, if you start even from chapter number one, God created man in his image and in his likeness, and he said, let them have dominion. And man began to dominate, man began to have dominion on the earth, and it was so powerful and so awesome, because as man um, began to walk in supernatural dominion, man could begin to name the animals. And the Bible says that um, uh, um, Adam named the animals. And whatever name he gave the animals, that is the name that the animals had. And even to date, you know, when he called a lion, he called it lion. And even to date, it is still called a lion. And nothing changed. An elephant is still called an elephant. That's the kind of dominion that Adam had. And so with the fall came the loss of dominion. 
So Jesus did not just come to redeem men um, um, in terms of just salvation, being saved from sin. Uh, because the Bible says in Romans 3.23 that the wages of sin is death. So when man sinned, his penalty was death. And Jesus came to uh, redeem us from that by being the prize, by being the Lamb of God that was to be sacrificed in our place, as it were. And so we are grateful for that. But that's not the only reason why Jesus came. He also came to restore the dominion that had been lost. And I want us to focus quite a bit on this dominion that had been lost because I believe that one of the problems in the body of Christ is that men do not understand the issue of dominion. The issue of going back to the Eden uh, um, lifestyle where men could dominate. Men today, we run away from snakes, we run away from lions, we run away from bears and all those kind of things because of the lost dominion. And so if we begin to embrace supernatural dominion in God through Jesus, you find that all these things that we are afraid of, COVID-19 and all other things that are happening all over the world, that fear will disappear simply because we'll have caught on to the dominion mandate. Can you say with me the dominion mandate? So in the Garden of Eden, we see a progression. Um, the problem, we see it in Genesis chapter number 3. Um, and uh, man sinned and, 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 and uh, you know, problems entered in, pain entered in, sickness entered in, disease entered in, you know, uh, a curse is pronounced upon man by God. We move on to uh, the New Testament where the solution is introduced. Jesus is, uh, uh, he comes through the womb of Mary and is born. That's the solution that is provided and Jesus is the word. Then we go to the cross, which is the plan, the plan of God to redeem man. Man had to be redeemed by Jesus. And people say, you know, uh, because when you talk about uh, uh, redemption and all of that, if you study in the Old Testament, you find that um, the, they already began to start to unleash the plan um, because the Old Testament is a shadow of things to come in the, in the New Testament. And so you find that there were rituals that were done year in and year out, um, you know, where the priest would sacrifice a lamb, you know, for the sins of man and all of that. And all of that was an attempt to bring men back to God. But all of that was always temporary. And I'm going to share with you quite a number of scriptures that are going to bring all this to light and bring this to the fore and show you that um, man could not be redeemed permanently by the blood of bullocks and goats and so on and so forth. And so it took the spotless blood of Jesus to redeem man, the perfect blood of Jesus. And we must understand that this is why uh, it, it, it couldn't be the blood of Joseph that redeemed us because Joseph was a man, he had sin. It took a spotless blood a blood without blemish, which is the blood of Jesus, the incorruptible blood of Jesus, the perfect blood of Jesus. That was the requirement for men to be redeemed. Although Abraham was the father of faith, his blood could not suffice to redeem men because Abraham had his issues with Haggai. David, though Jesus was the son of David, the blood of David could not suffice. David had his issues with Bathsheba and a whole lot of other issues. And so it required the perfect blood, which is the blood that came direct from God, which I call the divine blood, the spotless blood. And this is why Mary asked the question. It is, it's a very powerful question that she asked. She says, how shall this thing be since I do not know a man? How shall I get pregnant without knowing a man? And the Bible says that the Holy Ghost in Luke 1 shall come upon you and shall overshadow you. And this tells us that it took the Holy Ghost to impregnate Mary. That tells us that the blood of Jesus is a divine blood. Because you must understand even from biology that though you know a child is in the womb of the mother, it is the blood of the man that the child takes, takes on as their DNA. And so the blood of Jesus was blood type Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit that came upon Mary. That tells me that the Holy Spirit released his holy blood, the perfect blood was released 
into the womb of Mary. And so, though it was the womb of Mary, the womb of a man, it was simply God trying to combine divinity with humanity to ultimately save humanity, but it required a perfect blood to go as a sacrifice. Uh, the problem, sin came in. The solution, Jesus, the word was introduced in John chapter number one. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. All things were made by him. Without him was nothing made that was made. In him was life and that life was the light of men and the light shone in darkness and darkness comprehended it not and the word became flesh. That's Jesus introduced in John chapter number one. And then you find that in the same John chapter number one, um, this is where you, 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 you hear of John the Baptist saying, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away all the sins of the world. So Jesus is introduced into the equation. And then the master plan of God begins to be, to be revealed. You know, Jesus goes through all the issues with the disciples, teaching them, mentoring them, teaching them the ways of God. All he's trying to do is take us all back into a place of dominion, a place where we dominate in God and through God. And it's so... Um, uh, exciting because Jesus begins to exhibit dominion that man had never seen. He begins to exhibit um, the power of God that was not seen in the disciples. The disciples struggled. Jesus could do certain things that the disciples could not do. And it was really awesome and really powerful to see this happening because Jesus would heal the sick. The disciples would fail to do it. And this is because the, 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 the divine nature of God was in Jesus and it was not in the disciples. And so he was trying to uh, uh, integrate divinity into humanity. He was trying to release that supernatural impartation of the divine life. He was releasing it into men. And he was teaching them the ways of God. Teaching them the ways of the kingdom. But this was not going to be possible ultimately until Jesus went to the cross. And so the cross is so crucial and so important in our lives for us to understand and embrace the finished work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so the solution Jesus has provided, and then the plan is unleashed. The plan is the cross. That's the ultimate plan. To get to the cross, he passes through Gethsemane. Follow me now. Gethsemane is the process. It's the process whereby the Holy Spirit that was in Jesus begins to, to leave him. He begins to uh, uh, separate himself from Jesus, ultimately, so that crucifixion could take place. And so you find that after Gethsemane, then Jesus went to the cross. At the cross, even on his way to the cross, the Roman soldiers began to smite him. They began to uh, uh, you know, put all sorts of stripes on him, beating him. And the Bible tells us that by the stripes of Jesus who were healed. There are 39 stripes that were beaten onto Jesus' body. And the whole purpose of these stripes was not only for our healing, but the blood needed to be spilled as a sacrifice. It's so important. Jesus could not die of poisoning. Jesus could not die of uh, um, any other means except that he had to bleed out. It was important for the full blood of Jesus in his whole body to bleed out so that humanity could be saved. And these are truths that uh, uh, now have seemed to have been alienated from the body of Christ. And, 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 and people think that, you know, they come to church to prosper. They just come to church to get healed, uh, you know. But we come to church so that we can be partakers of the divine nature by understanding. And this is the key word this morning. Understanding what was done on Calvary for you. You need to understand it. And the Holy Spirit said to me last night, he says, tell my people that you cannot benefit from something you do not fully understand. And I believe that this is where the problem comes in the body of Christ, where people are not fully understanding what was done for them. And I love the Apostle Paul because you see, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they tell us what happened, how Jesus came, how he was born, how he went to the cross, how he was betrayed by Judas. They tell us what happened. But I love the Apostle Paul because the Apostle Paul tells us why it happened. And when you can understand the why, the why, the reason why it happened, then you can become a partaker, a partaker of the divine nature. And so, and then we get to, 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 to uh, you know, the cross. Jesus dies on the cross. He bleeds out, um, you know, the antidote is released 
uh, which is the blood of Jesus. And from that blood of Jesus, there's so much benefit. I want to go deeper in this. You know, I, I want to attack it from a different um, and unexpected angle, as it were. I want us to go to the book of Ephesians. All right. In the book of Ephesians, chapter number one. And I want us to, wherever you are, open your Bible with me, please, to Ephesians chapter number one. We're going to start in uh, roundabout verse number 15. We see there how the Apostle Paul explains to us um, in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 2. It's quite a long read, but bear with me. I promise you, you will be blessed. The Bible says here in verse number 15, Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. This is the Apostle Paul speaking, that he makes mention of us in his prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Spirit of wisdom and revelation where? In the knowledge of Him, right? Not just knowing Him, but also knowing what He did for us and knowing why He did it for us. Remember what I said, taking us back to the place of dominion. Watch this. The Bible says in verse number 18, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened... That you may know, that you may know, not think, but that you may know. So when our eyes are enlightened, we get to know. What do we know? What is the hope of his calling and what are the riches, what are the riches of the glory of the inheritance of the saints? So there are things that the saints inherit. There are things that the saints partake of in this whole process of the death burial and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Follow me, it's going to get interesting in a minute. So there are things that we partake of and these are the things that people do not know. That's why people are busy in prayer lines, you know, and it's okay, you know, you know, seeking for prayers and all of that. It's fine, but there's a better way because when you are a partaker of the divine nature, when you are a partaker of the benefits of the cross, when you understand who you are now in Christ, now that Christ has died for you, now that Christ was raised from the dead, not only was he raised from the dead, not only did he die, but when he died, we died in him. And I'll show you all the scriptures to prove what I'm saying. I'm just introducing the subject. We died in him. We were buried with him. And we were raised with him. And all these things, as we understand that not only did we die with him, not only were we, were we buried with him, but we were also raised with him. And not only are we raised with him, we are now seated with him at the right hand of power. Now, that changes the perspective of everything that you've been looking at. That changes all the dynamics, as it were. I think it's a better way to put it. It changes all the dynamics. It changes how I view myself. I don't view myself as a victim. I view myself as a victor. I don't view myself as, as somebody who's just desperate for prayer, seeking for prayers. I now view myself as a partaker of the finished work of Jesus Christ. I now view myself as a person who is in dominion, who is in Christ. No more do I pray beggarly prayers, but I pray prayers that are so powerful and so awesome because these prayers are prayed from a place of dominion. So I'm praying now from a place of dominion because I understand that I'm in Christ. Follow me. Then it says in verse 19, after he talks about the inheritance of the, uh, inheritance of the saints in verse 18. And he says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? So power, greatness of his power is released towards us who believe. Who believe what was done for us by Christ Jesus on the cross of Calvary. And then he says, Which he worked in Christ. So all this power being released unto us, the inheritance of the saints, it was all being worked in Christ Jesus when? When he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the Father in heavenly places. Then it says, far above principalities and powers, dominions, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And watch this. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all the church. And so this, was, this is what happened on the cross of Calvary. Christ now was 
getting the dominion back for us. Remember, the dominion that was lost by Adam and Eve in the garden. When Christ came back, when Christ came to earth, he was coming to take that dominion, to give it to the saints, that now we can become divine uh, partakers of divine nature through what Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary. And so we are not beggarly Christians. You and I are not beggarly Christians. You and I are power-packed Christians. Amazing Christians. We are uh, uh, children of the Most High God. The Bible says in Psalm 82 verse 5 to 7, He says, Do you not know that ye are gods? And He says, And I mean all of you are children of the Most High God. And as we are children of the Most High God, we are gods. We have the divine nature. The power of the living God, the very nature of God is on the inside of us. Child of God, you are not ordinary. You're not a victim, you are a victor. And the Bible says here in, in verse 21, I'm going to go back to verse 21, it says, Far above principalities and powers, this is Jesus, and might and dominion. So, if I am in Christ and seated with him in heavenly places, far above principalities and powers, I'm far above all those things. I'm far above poverty. I'm far above hardship. I'm far above lack and want. That's the purpose of, of the cross, to put me far above all the challenges that I have been facing. And so right now, we are living under things which, which we should be over. I'll put that to you again. We are living under things which we should be over. We should be dominating sickness. We should be dominating disease. We have the power, the dominion. Jesus has given us that position, that position, position. I want you to understand your position in Christ. You are not just born again to be saved from the penalty of sin. Yes, that's powerful and that's awesome and we'll get into that in a little while. But while I still have your attention, while your mind is still at its sharpest, I want to give you the, the meat of the word. We're not only redeemed from sin, we, are, we have been given dominion. Through Christ and in Christ. We are in Christ. We are born again in Christ. We are now children of the Most High God. The power and the dominion has been restored back unto us. And it's time for us to exercise that power. We need to exercise that power again. No more shall we have a form of godliness. Denying the power thereof. We're going to have the true power. We're going to have the true dominion. We're going to dominate over the world economy, as it were. We're going to dominate over poverty. We're going to dominate over sickness. Dominate over disease. Dominate over curses. And all these things that the enemy has done and is doing is simply because we have not understood our position in Christ, which was attained on the cross of Calvary by Christ Jesus and handed over to us. I remember the scriptures, it says he has given us the keys to death, hell, and the grave. He has given us the keys to dominate once again. I really believe somebody is catching on to their dominion Monday today and that things are going to change. Let's finish this scripture and then I'm going to go into um, these points one by one. And the Bible says here, if we jump, you know, maybe to uh, uh, verse number 22, he says, uh, we're in Ephesians 1, verse number 22, and he says, and he's put all things under his feet. Now, if the things have been put under the feet of Jesus, and I'm in Jesus, that means that as I become a partaker of things being, uh, uh, of, of, of the dominion of Jesus, am I, as I'm a partaker of the dominion of Jesus, and I am in Jesus, and the things have been put under his feet, that means that the works of the enemy are also now under my feet. They are under my feet. And I'm operating from today from a position of power, dominion, and authority. I want, I, I want God to help us to take the church back to the dominion mandate. We're going to dominate. We're going to dominate on planet earth. We're going to dominate over recession. Because you see, so many people right now, they are worried about recession. You know, where are things going to go? What's going to happen? But I'm telling you, we're going to dominate again. We're going to go back to the place of dominion as we understand our position in Christ. Now watch this. And I want you to write this down. As I understand my position, I can change my condition. 
As I understand my position, I can change my situation. And I can change it from a place of understanding my power and my dominion in Christ. My position in Christ is far above principalities, far above powers, far above thrones, far above the dominion of the enemy. And I'm going to dominate because I'm going to gain a greater understanding. And I pray that somebody are gaining a greater understanding. I pray that, Lord, you're helping me to, 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 to make it plain and make it clear. All things are going to be under the feet of the saints. And I prophesy over your life, you who's watching me, that you're going to be in a place of dominion. You're going to dominate. Just like Christ dominated here on planet Earth, you're going to dominate. Just like Christ never lacked on Earth, you're, going to, you're not going to lack anything. The Bible says... I was young and now I'm old, yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor the seed begging for bread. You're not going to beg for any bread because you're going to operate from a place of dominion. Everything that you've been suffering under, you're going to be on top of that situation. You're going to rise above it. The Bible says you're the head and not the tail. You're above only and not beneath. And I release that power and that grace upon you, even as you're understanding this word in the name of Jesus. The things you've been struggling with, the things that um, you've been oppressed by you're gonna rise above those things because of understanding that christ came not only to die for your sins but to take you back to the place of dominion in god in the name of jesus and i want us to go now to ephesians 2 ephesians chapter number 2 says here from verse number 1 and you he made alive who were dead in your trespasses and in sin in other words when we were walking in a life of sin we were dead, but Christ made us alive. This is part of the transactions on the cross of Calvary. He says in verse 2, In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. We've moved away from all that disobedience because we've given our lives to God. We are no longer walking like that. Verse number 3, Among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, watch this, God is rich in mercy because of his great love. You know, and I, and, 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 and I say to the person I was talking to this morning, great friend of mine, I said, the cross is a picture of God's love. It's a picture of God's love. He says, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us. In other words, he did this bringing Jesus onto earth because of the love that he had for us. He saw that man was so lost. Man was failing to find his way back to God. So God, in his love, found a way for man to go back to God. Now that's love. That's serious love. Because it's God who had been wronged by man. Man had sinned against God, but God, being the bigger person, as it were, took the initiate, initiative of reconciliation with man by being the one to take the first step, sending Jesus to redeem man and bring man back to God. Now that's love. That's love. And that's a lesson for, for many of us that take the initiative. If there's issues between you and somebody, be the bigger person. Be the one that brings the reconciliation. And that's what God did for us. Follow me to become clear. He says, even when we were dead in trespasses, made alive together with Christ by grace, and you were saved. That's what salvation is about. And raised up together. So when Jesus rose from the dead, we were raised together with him and made, and made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, this is just justifying everything I, I was explaining to you before. Verse 7, Then in the ages to come, he might show his great, his exceeding great riches of his grace to his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace we have been saved through faith and not of ourselves, but it is the gift of God. Hallelujah. Not of works lest any man should boast. So this is not by works. It's all by grace. It's a gift from God. Salvation is a gift from God. Right? So it's not by works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, 
which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Hallelujah. And I believe that we're going to walk in the power, in the grace of God. And we're going to walk in supernatural dominion. This is a game changer. Everything that's going to happen from today is going to change because you're in a place where you are understanding what God did for you in Christ Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Watch this. One of the things I love about what Jesus did is he came to bring us back to the original intention of God, to the life of dominion. Now, look at this. Look at the way that the disciples struggled with power and dominion before Christ died and how they began to exhibit power that even the shadow of the disciples was healing people. After the cross, you see at the gate, gate called Beautiful, the disciples there, they, you know, a man had been sitting there for years. They'd been watching him uh, uh, sit there for many, many years. He was lame. But after the cross, they had the power and the dominion to say to him, Hey, look on us. There's something new about us. We are now walking in the resurrected power. And they told him to get up from where he was sitting. And he was healed. That same hour, he, he rose from there because the disciples were now walking in dominion. So we only see the dominion factor after the cross. It's so powerful and so profound that the disciples, they were now uh, uh, people who were referred to as, it is you know, so clear that they're being with Jesus, that they are now walking on another level of, of, of power and dominion. People were now afraid of the disciples after the cross because they now had the power of God. And, and that's how we, the saints of the New Testament, are supposed to walk, to walk in absolute dominion. Dominion. Dominate. Dominate witchcraft. I don't want you to be afraid of witches and wizards in your family because you have the power of the resurrected Christ on the inside of you. And the Bible says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And that's the thing about what happened to the cross of Calvary. The greater one was being unleashed into your life and is greater than any witch, any wizard that is in the world. So the dominion was restored unto you. Watch this. We were now reintroduced into the commonwealth. The commonwealth, if you go back now to the book of Ephesians chapter number 2, the Bible says in verse number 11, Therefore we remember that you once Gentiles, that's us, before Jesus came to connect us. We were once Gentiles in the flesh. We were called uncircumcised, right? By what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. That at that time we were without Christ, being alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant. So you and I are no longer strangers to the covenant. Through what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, he brought us into the commonwealth of Israel. So we are now spiritual Jews, as it were, through what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary. So the Jewish people are no longer the only privileged few people in the world. We are now also Jews and partakers of that covenant that the Jews have with God through what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. So the prosperity that is experienced uh, by the Israelites, by the Jews, I can become a partaker of that by understanding. Understanding is so, impo is so important and so powerful. When I understand what Jesus did, how he connected me to God, when I have an understanding of that, then I am a partaker of what I understand. And I believe that many, many of God's children are going to begin to understand on another level and another dimension who they are, whose they are, what they have in God and in Christ. Partakers of divine nature in the name of Jesus. One of the things that happened is that when Jesus came, it is what I call the great exchange. Let me explain the great exchange. The great exchange is when Jesus came, he came and he on the cross, he took my sin and gave me his righteousness. He took my sin and gave me his righteousness. He took our sickness and gave us divine health. That's the exchange. He took our sickness and released divine health. So I am a partaker of divine health released by Jesus on the cross of Calvary. 
He took away curses and released the blessing. So he took my curses and he gave me the blessing. He took away my poverty that I inherited through the blood, my family blood. He took it away and he released his prosperity. Somebody say the exchange. Very powerful. He took away my bondage and released deliverance. He took away my stress and released his peace. He took away death and he gave me Zoe life. The God kind of life. He took away my, my weakness and released his strength. That's a great exchange. And he took away my humanity and gave me divinity. He took away the limitations of my flesh and he released the Holy Spirit. It's important that we understand. And I want you to turn with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter number, number 53. Isaiah tells us, he says in Isaiah 53, verse number 3 to 6, he says, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Now, he's talking about what Jesus uh, was doing, you know, uh, pre the cross, you know, all the way from Gethsemane right up to the cross and beyond. I, the prophet Isaiah was seeing this prophetically in the spirit. And then he tells us what was accomplished. He says, surely he has borne our griefs. In other words, all the things we're grieving about, all this can be taken care of at the cross. Grief was put on him at the cross. And so it was taken away from us. Whatever was put on Jesus, watch this. Whatever was put on Jesus on the cross was being taken away from us. That's the great exchange that was happening. So he bore our griefs and he carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. So all those iniquities of the forefathers, that was being taken care of on the cross. So what do I do today? I pray. If, if I'm seeing iniquities in the background of my, of, of my family, I now pray and I apply what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. I apply it so that it can take care of the iniquities that are in my family. Watch this. If I don't apply what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, the iniquities and the consequences of the iniquities will remain. Let me give you an example. You can take a bar of soap. You can buy a bar of soap from whatever supermarket you choose, pick and pay, spa, bon marché. You can buy a bar of soap and you can just put it in your drawer. Buying the soap or knowing about the soap does not make you clean. It's like knowing what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary is not enough. You've got to take the finished work of Jesus and apply it to your life. You've got to take, like, let's, let, let me give you a, a typical example. The Bible says here, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Now, there's a lot of teaching of, on, on dealing with the iniquities of the forefathers. Right? So, what do I do? I take what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary being bruised for my iniquities and I pray and I say my father my God I thank you that I do not have to continue in these iniquities because Jesus was bruised for my iniquities so when he was being bruised the Roman soldiers were bruising him they did not understand what they were doing they were actually bruising him for my iniquities it was part of God's plan so I take the bruising of Jesus and I apply it to my situation today so that takes care of the iniquities of the forefathers so I take care of that situation by taking what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary bruising of the iniquities and applying it onto my life so I take care of the iniquities of my forefathers on my mother's side on my father's side by applying the bruising of Jesus onto my situation and I'm saying I don't have to continue to walk in iniquities because Jesus was bruised for these iniquities and so I can't pay a price that Jesus paid for. That's double jeopardy. I can't be paying for what Jesus paid for. So the iniquities of my forefathers were taken care of by the bruising of Jesus. 
Watch this. If I am ignorant of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, this is what's going to happen. The iniquities will continue to affect my life. The devil will continue to use the iniquities against me. Though Jesus was bruised for the iniquities, I still have to claim what he did on the cross of Calvary. Go back to my example of soap. If I buy soap from the supermarket and I put it in my drawer, that does not make me clean. I know about the soap. I know what the soap can do. But I still have to apply the soap onto my body to clean my body. So knowing about the soap is not enough. Buying the soap is not enough. Putting the soap in the drawer is not enough. Getting into a shower without soap is not enough. I need to take the soap and apply it onto my life. So I need to take the bruising of the iniquities that was done by Jesus, the bruising or, or that was done on Jesus and apply it against the iniquities. I hope somebody is gaining understanding because it is this understanding that will change everything in your life. Understand what was done. As he was being bruised, the iniquities were being taken care of. And the Bible says, and by his stripes, we were healed. 39 stripes were put on the body of Jesus. And there are 39 types of diseases. So every single sickness, disease that ever was or will come was taken care of. They are all within the 39 categories of sicknesses and diseases, including coronavirus. It was taken care of on the cross of Calvary. So I can't be afraid of something that Jesus took care of many years ago. What do I do? I take the stripes of Jesus by this understanding and saying, by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. That's Isaiah chapter number 53. It says, by the stripes of Jesus, we were healed. So the healing took place long ago. Let me give this to you. You were healed from coronavirus many, many years ago. So we take the stripe, the particular stripe, that was put on Jesus, that relates to coronavirus, we take that stripe, we claim it into our lives, and say, coronavirus, you have no part, no portion in my life. You were taken away already by Jesus. Over 2,000 years ago, there was a particular stripe that was smitten onto you by a Roman soldier. The Roman soldiers did not understand that when they were striking Jesus, they were putting stripes on him. And these stripes were taking care of every sickness, every disease, cancer, leukemia, anything that the devil would ever throw at us in terms of sickness and disease was being taken care of according to Isaiah 53. By the stripes of Jesus, we were healed. We were healed of coronavirus over 2,000 years ago. So what do I do? I take what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. I take those stripes and I apply them to my life today, 2020. And I say, coronavirus, you have no power. You were taken care of already by Jesus. You were taken care of already by Jesus. Things that the devil is planning, whatever the devil has a plan for in my life, was taken care of on the cross of Calvary. Any plan that the devil has, there's an answer on the cross of Calvary. So I take what was done on the cross of Calvary and I apply it to my situation today. Saints, if you catch what I'm sharing with you today, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it's going to change everything. All the dynamics are going to change. All that fear that you have is simply a result of ignorance. Fear is because of fear. Fear is because of ignorance to a solution. When I understand the solution, I, I don't need to fear. I don't fear school fees, I got the money. I don't fear sickness and disease, Jesus took care of it. It was taken care of. So the Bible says, my people perish for what? For lack of knowledge. So when you don't know the solution has been made available, you have reason to fear. So the devil does not want you to have this knowledge. He just wants you to keep on going to church. He doesn't mind as long as you don't get to know about what Calvary achieved for you. This is why when we lay hands on people, if you notice, when we lay hands on people in church, a lot of miracles happen at Kingdom Prosperity Ministries. Why? Because as the man of God, by the grace of God, I have an understanding of, of how to use the cross of Calvary 
how to use the finished work of Jesus. People don't get healed in my name. That's why when I pray, I always say in the name of Jesus. Because I'm claiming what was done by Jesus. That's why when I lay hands on the sick, they recover. Because number one, I say in the name of Jesus. Number two, I also apply this scripture, Isaiah 53. The Bible says, by his stripes, you were healed. What am I doing? I'm taking the finished work of Jesus over 2,000 years ago. And I'm applying those finished works onto the life of somebody today in 2020. And I'm saying by those stripes over 2,000 years ago, you were healed today. And it's so important that you understand that we can take what Jesus did and apply it into our lives today. That's so powerful and so awesome. And I see your life changing even from today in the name of Jesus. But I believe that you got something today and that God has truly blessed you. He has elevated you into a place where you now understand what was done by Christ for you on the cross of Calvary. I really believe that you are entering into another phase of your life, a phase of headship, a phase of dominion, a phase of power. I believe power Christians are being birthed. Like Micah said, I'm full of power by the Holy Ghost. And one of the things that I love about the cross, and I'll close with this, is the cross ushered us into a place where the Holy Spirit was unleashed by Jesus. I remember Jesus began to say to the disciples, he says, you know, you're not happy because I'm saying I'm going away, but he says it's better. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Holy Spirit cannot come. Jesus was saying, after the cross, as I go up to be with the Father, I am releasing the Holy Spirit. Aros Paracletus, the helper, the Holy Spirit, another of the same kind. Jesus unlimited, that's the Holy Spirit. Jesus could only be in one place at one time, but the Holy Spirit is in all places at any given time. And I believe in the name of Jesus, that same power of God is going to be released upon your life in the name of Jesus. And I declare and I decree as you stretch your hands towards your gadget and as I stretch my hands towards you, I release the power of the Holy Spirit upon your life. I decree that everything that we have shared here this morning will begin to benefit the saints. And the saints would grow and increase in power and in dominion. In the mighty and precious name of Jesus, may the saints begin to grow. May the saints begin to walk in dominion. May they walk in power. May they walk in unusual grace in the name of Jesus. May they walk in resurrection power in the name of Jesus. May the saints walk and, 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 and move in the power of the Holy Spirit. May they have power over all powers of the enemy. Any challenge that the saints are facing, I decree in the name of Jesus that the saints would dominate. Whatever the enemy has planned, every device of the enemy is being subdued. The Bible says, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, Isaiah 59 verse number 19, the Spirit of the Lord will raise a standard against the enemy. Today we raise a standard against poverty, against hardship, against COVID-19. We raise a standard against you. No plague shall come near your dwelling place in the name of Jesus. I declare and I decree, a thousand may fall at your side, a thousand may fall at your left hand, but it shall not come near your dwelling place. You are protected. You are God protected. The strong hand of the Lord is upon you. The Holy Spirit is around you. The fire of the Holy Spirit is around your home. I declare and I decree, supernatural divine protection is your portion. In the mighty and precious name of Jesus. Says the Holy Spirit just dropped something in my spirit and is saying, Remind them to keep praying that prayer. There's a, a prayer one hour long that I did. And the prayer, uh, I, I think it's called the Word of God versus COVID-19. COVID-19 is no match for the Word of God. Begin to pray that prayer in your home every single day. You can find it on Facebook. You can find it on YouTube. Just, 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 you know, uh, punch in there my name, Apostle Rodney Chipoera, KPM TV, Kingdom Prosperity Ministries. And that prayer against COVID-19, that prayer has gone viral. It's help, helping so many people around the world, friends and relatives of people. People have told me of testimonies, even in the United Kingdom, even in America. People who have played that prayer and have been delivered from that COVID-19. 
And I decree as you play that prayer, even you, even if you're not afflicted, that COVID-19 shall not come near your dwelling place. In the name of Jesus, I pray that you are blessed. I want to encourage you today um, as we close. This April, between now and the end of April, I want you to put together and package, package an offering just to appreciate what God has done for us. A thanksgiving offering just to appreciate what he did for us through Christ Jesus. And I believe that the power of the cross, the power of the cross, I want to go deeper in this message at some point. The power of the cross will be released upon your life. I pray that today you have understood what it means to be a child of God, what it means to be saved, what it means to operate in God's class. I believe that you are blessed. We love you so much. Thank you for joining us. And I believe that um, I'm going to send a notice out there um, in the next couple of days. And we're going to take Holy Communion together with an understanding of what Holy Communion is all about. I'll share a 15-minute message about Holy Communion, what it's all about. And I know that as we take Holy Communion with understanding, it has more power and more potency and will truly change our lives and will be partakers of the divine nature of Christ. I pray for you as we close that the hand of the Lord would be upon you. The grace of God will be upon you. Remember to continue to do your kingdom commitments, your tithes, your offerings. And um, I pray that God's special hand would be upon your life. You continue to be blessed. Share these teachings with other people. You are a blessing. We love you. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us. Amen. Remember, fear no COVID-19. God send us upon you. You are blessed. Amen. We know that the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word is eternal. Breaking the chains, unlocking your destiny.